The meeting is open and the live stream has started. Thank you. Good evening, Azusa community, students, parents, and staff. Welcome to our regular board meeting of education. I would like to call the meeting to order on Tuesday, February 13, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. We are now moving on to um, 1.2, roll call. Board member Arianes? Present. Board member Greer? Here. Board member Bo? Here. And I am present, and board member Benavides will not be with us today. Now we're moving on to item 1.3, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Motion to approve 2.1. Motion by board member Arianes. Can I have a second? Second. Second by board member Greer. Any discussion? Seeing none, place your votes, please. We can take a hand vote. Board Member Bo? Yes. Board Member Arianes? Yes. Board Member Greer? Yes. And I'm a, I'm a yes. Um, four, yes. Uh, now we'll be moving to item 2.1, public comment on closed session items. Hope, do we have any blue cards? Lika, do we have anyone, any hands risen in the Zoom? We have no hands raised on Zoom. So we will now close and move to closed session and we'll um, resume at 7 p.m. Mr. Mata is joined tonight by his three children, Tatiana, an Azusa graduate, Viviana, who attends Glassville Middle School, and Matthew, who is a fifth grade at Paramount. His wife, Michelle, 25 years, cannot be here tonight, but I'm sure she will watch the re replay on YouTube. Tonight, I have the honor of sharing with you the things Mr. Mata does that makes him a special part of our Paramount community. Mr. Mata is always willing to help with student activities and PTA events. He will donate items to support our celebration of student achievement. When it comes to our annual spring carnival, Mr. Mata will be the first one there to help us set up and the last one to leave to make sure everything is taken down and our campus is ready for the next school day. Mr. Mata is also very thoughtful and appreciative towards our Paramount staff. Out of the blue, Mr. Mata will come in and bring treats for our staff just to say thank you. And my office staff really thanks you. <laughs> On top of all that, Mr. Mata is committed to the education of his children and attends parent meetings and workshops. He also loves spending time with his children, especially driving RC cars with his son, Matthew. And just like on his poster, you can also find Mr. Mata on Thursdays playing basketball at Memorial Park. These are just a few examples of the type of person Mr. Mata is. Very generous, committed, dedicated, and thoughtful individual that we are lucky to have as part of our Paramount community. On behalf of all our staff and students at Paramount, we would like to thank you, Mr. Mata, for everything you do. And it is my honor, once again, to introduce you as Paramount Elementary's 2024 Parent of the Year. Thank you. Buenas noches, Presidenta de la Mesa Directiva, Rodríguez Peña, miembros de la Mesa Directiva de Educación, Gabinete y Asistentes. Mi nombre es Horacio Trejo y es un gran orgullo servir como director de Validel. Esta noche tengo el honor de presentar a nuestra estimada nominada, a Padre del Año, Rosalba Ramírez. Rosalba Ejemplifica el corazón y el espíritu de nuestra comunidad. Conocida cariñosamente como Miss Rosie, se ha ganado el cariño y respeto no solo de nuestros estudiantes, sino también de nuestros padres. 
Esto es, se debe a que ella es un modelo de bondad, una fuente de consuelo, tanto para los estudiantes como para los padres. El año pasado, ella fue la cara de bienvenida para nuestros vikingos, saludando a los padres y abriendo las puertas de los autos cuando los niños llegaban para pasar el día. Este año, debido a la reorganización, se modificó su ubicación. El impacto de su ausencia se sintió de inmediato y numerosos padres expre expresaron cuánto extrañaban su presencia, reconoci reconociendo su capacidad única para aportar alegría y calma para la rutina de la mañana. Hicimos ajustes para que volviera a desempeñar ese mismo papel, lo que resultó en vikingos felices e incluso alivió la congestión del tráfico en nuestro estacionamiento principal, porque la pusimos en la entrada del sur y la gente está haciendo todo lo posible para moverse, para verla allá hacia el sur. La influencia de la señora Rossi se extiende más allá de sus deberes del trabajo. Ella es un líder activa en nuestras clases de ESL, una voz respetada en el Consejo Asesor de Escuelas Comunitarias y miembro de nuestro ILAC. A pesar de vivir en San Bernardino, viaja diariamente a Susa, impulsada por su compromiso con la visión y misión de nuestra escuela. A menudo afirma que nuestra, encuentra inspiración en nuestra escuela, pero debo decir que somos nosotros quienes nos inspiramos en ella. Ella contribuye incansablemente en los salones y en, en eventos escolares. Rosalba es más que un miembro de nuestra comunidad, ella es un regalo para la ciudad de Azusa, que encarna el espíritu de servicio y bondad al que todos aspiramos. Gracias, señora Rossi, y estamos entusiasmados por ver hacia dónde la llevará su viaje de crecimiento personal. Gracias. Good evening, Board President Rodriguez Pena, Board Members, Cabinet, and Attendees. My name is Sam Perdomo, and I am the proud principal of Gladstone Middle School. It gives me great pleasure to present Cesar Camacho as Gladstone Middle School's very first parent of the year. All right. As, as you may or may not notice, Mr. Camacho could not be with us, be with, here tonight with us because he is ill. And so I, we wish him a speedy recovery. However, we must go on. Whatever activity event that is occurring at GMS, you will be certain to find Mr. Camacho at one of those functions. Mr. Camacho participates and attends all coffee, the principal and school side council meetings. During all the meetings, Mr. Camacho always gives constructive input and is an advocate for the school and its programs. For instance, during the school side council meeting, we were developing a drop off and pickup map for the GMS safety plan and Mr. Camacho felt it would be a great idea to make an aerial view of the map. We thought it was a good idea and Mr. Camacho volunteered to make it with routes. A couple of days later, I had it on my desk with an apology for being late. I thought, are you kidding me? I didn't expect it for a few weeks. In addition, Mr. Camacho was instrumental in making certain our staff lounge was decorated and set up for our staff Christmas decoration, uh, Christmas celebration, sorry. Moreover, with respect to Mr. Camacho being involved in his daughter Sylvia's education, Mr. Camacho makes certain that his, that Sylvia is in school every day and doing well academically. This is truly evident as his daughter Sylvia, who is an eighth grader at GMS, has a high GPA. In addition, Mr. Camacho believes that good parenting involves promoting self-respect for themselves and others. Finally, Mr. Camacho notes that being involved in in Sylvia's education and school meeting activities not only assists her, but also builds a community for other students to enjoy. Fun fact, everybody knows I always give a fun fact. I knew I had a connection with Mr. Camacho because our same drink of choice is Diet Dr. Pepper. So. <laughs> GMS is so lucky to have Cesar Camacho as a contributor parent, and we are lucky to have him at GMS. Congratulations, Mr. Camacho.
Buenas noches, Presidente de la Mesa Directiva, Señora Rodríguez Peña, miembros de la Mesa Directiva de Educación, Gabinete y Asistentes. Mi nombre es Señor Fernández y el director de la Zusa High School. Es un honor para nosotros reconocer a Señora Albarán como la Madre del Año en la Zusa High School para 2023-2024. Con nosotros esta noche tenemos equipo de poder, uh, señora Clark, señora Bracamonte, señora Cortés, su hijo uh, Gerardo, también los brazos, su esposo y su, su hija está en su iglesia esta noche. La señora Abraham ha estado involucrado en la escuela secundaria Zusa durante muchos años, en los talleres de educación para, el padre, para padres y como la, en la banda de música de Zusa High School. Ella es una voz, una voz fuerte a favor de la participación de los padres y busca oportunidades para que todas las familias participen en el Zusa High School. Más allá de dedicar su tiempo a la escuela, lo dedica a la comunidad con el Zusa Beautiful y en su iglesia. Ella es un excelente ejemplo para sus hijos y su amor brilla a través de ellos. Alicia Abraham es una dedicada seguridora de la banda de música Azusa. Durante los últimos tres años, años ha estado presente en todos los eventos musicales, apoyando al señor Miquena con logística y recaudación de fondos. Ella se asegura de que los estudiantes de la banda de música están bien atendidos durante la temporada de competencias y dedica innumerables horas de su tiempo los fines de semana a hacer lo que sea necesario para los músicos. Más allá de su apoyo al programa de banda, la señora Abraham participa regularmente en talleres y reuniones para padres. Su presencia tranquila en las reuniones aporta una energía positiva a la comunidad que es vital a medida que construimos una asociación sólida con y entre todos los padres de la escuela secundaria de Zusa. Su liderazgo con los padres es muy apreciado y con, su, con sus hijos de noveno grado y de la escuela secundaria de Susa, la presencia de la señora Abraham se sentirá en los años venideros. Gerardo y Samantha tienen una suerte de tener una mamá con señora Abraham. La escuela secundaria de Susa está orgullosa de nuestra madre del año, señora Abraham. As you have heard this evening, the caliber and the commitment of the individuals that we recognize tonight is unmatched, and we are beyond fortunate to have all of them support the students in Azusa Unified. It is now my pleasure to introduce Azusa Unified's Parent of the Year, representing Sierra High School, Ms. Marcia Santos. Good evening again, Board President Rodriguez Pena, Board of Education, Cabinet, our awardees, and attendees of the evening. My name is Teresa Peterson, Principal of Sierra High School. Our Sierra Parent of the Year once again, and District Parent of the Year, Mrs. Marcia Jimenez Santos. Mrs. Santos is joined by her family, her children, Mariah, Elijah, Italia, Scarlet Rose, Malachi, her nieces and nephews, Emma, Jaden, Damien, and Malik, and also her sister, Jasmine. Mrs. Santos, or Marcia, as many of you know her, is no stranger to a lot of people around our district and throughout our city. 
I have heard on multiple occasions, does she have an identical twin or a triplet? Because there's no possible way that one person can be involved in so many things. She's a part of PAC, the district community advisory, the district safety committee, Sierra School Site Council, and so, so, so much more. I could go on and on with the list of things she's involved in and contributes to, but we really don't have all night. And no list could really ever do justice to the unwavering commitment and love that she shows day in and day out, not only for our students at Sierra, but our students in the entire district of Azusa Unified School District as a whole. Mrs. Santos is a dedicated parent with children at multiple AUSD schools. She's driven to not only contribute and ensure that her children are in the best and most supportive school environments that allow them to shine as individuals, but that all our Azusa students have the same access and opportunities. Her enthusiasm for equity in education and her genuine concern for the well being of students has made a lasting impact. Mrs. Santos consistently goes above and beyond to advocate and shift stereotypes so our students can be proud of the school and district that they attend, all while helping to ensure that all students feel valued and supported in their educational journey. It is with great honor and enthusiasm that I get to stand next to one of the greatest advocates for our students. As a result, she's not only selected as our Sierra Parent of the Year, but also the Azusa Unified School District Parent of the Year. Congratulations, Mrs. Marcia Jimenez Santos. Good evening, Board Member President Rodriguez Pena, Board of Education members, and cabinet and attendees. So when I was told that I had to do a speech or an acceptance speech, I didn't know what to write. Um, I, I'm not one good to speak about myself. Um, I believe that what I do is what all you parents that are here today, what we do, not just for our children, but for the children of the community. Um, I believe that if we wanna make a difference, we have to make ourselves present in our child's life and not just our children because there's children that don't have that opportunity for X amount of reasons. But if we wanna make the change, we have to be the ones to be there for them because our children will succeed because we're there pushing them along the way. And many of you have played that role in my children's life and in other children's life. So as was mentioned, I don't just for the kids in the Zuzu Unified school, school District, but for the kids in the community. I believe that the change that we want for tomorrow, we need to work on it for today. And we use whatever education we have to build and uplift everybody else. And I do what I do because I have that passion for that love for all the children and all the people in our community, not just my children. Um, I know that sometimes we talk about what, um, stigma that, oh, what is the district doing to do changes? And you don't understand all the work that they put in until you are part of everything they do. Getting to meet and work with alongside collaboration with our district parents, I get to see that. And I am so proud to say that my children come to the Unified School District. Um, last thing is, I know that I've been asked, do I have a twin? No, I don't, but one thing that I do have and every single volunteer that does this is a volunteer doesn't always have the time, they have the heart. And that's what I believe that we are all here for. That love that we'll spread and keep on spreading and we'll spread it to our children. Thank you everyone.
Do any board members have any comments? Board member Cruz? I just wanna say, first of all, congratulations to all of the parents who were honored here tonight. A common theme that I hear throughout is just this, this common thread of not only loving and caring and, and serving on behalf of your own child, but the ways that you're loving and caring and serving on behalf of kids uh, there at, at your school sites across the district and across the community. And so just wanna say congratulations and thank you for everything that you do. Um, and to Marsha in particular, congratulations to you. Um, I know for me, as, as I get the, the, the different reports and, and see the, the social media posts online kind of announcing things, I, I see it and I'm, I'm in no way surprised. And I look at it and I say, yes, that, that's fitting. And so where you say you don't like to, to talk a whole lot about yourself, let me just, just say um, thank you so much for, for just the, the impact that you make on our, on our community for the ways that you have impacted my own family and shown love and care for my own daughter and how I've, I've experienced that, my family has experienced that and so many other families here in our community have as well. And so congratulations and thank you to you. Board, mem board member Bo. Good evening and congratulations to all of our awardees tonight. Uh, on behalf of all members of the board and the entire district staff, as parents, parent figures, guardians, and family members, you are your child's first teacher, and that role is irreplaceable. Um, it means early mornings, late night, a lot of tears sometimes, and a lot of laughter, and we simply couldn't do it without your day in and day out partnership. So I wanna congratulate and thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much. Board member Arianes. Escuché que muchos de los padres, uh, perdón, uh, de los uh, administradores que ahora uh, estuvieron hablando fueron en español, so voy a hablar en español. Las personas que están aquí recibiendo lo, la, los certificados que son los padres, the parents that are here receiving these certificates today are not just certificates, right? It's not just recognition, it's the way that you live. Es como ustedes viven. Que ustedes pueden dar tanto amor, you guys can give so much love, right? Not only to your children, no nomás a sus hijos, pero a los hijos de uno. Porque yo soy padre en, esta, en, esta, en este distrito. Ya tengo dos hijos que han pasado por aquí y tengo dos más. Afortunadamente no puedo dar el tiempo ya como daba antes, pero me da mucha alegría. It bring, brings joy to my heart to see so many of you guys give your heart and soul for this district, because this district's special, and it's special because of you. So just remember that, and I'm super happy to join you guys today in joining all of us in congratulating you, y dándole el aplauso a todos ustedes, porque sin ustedes, padres, nosotros no tenemos distrito. Without you parents, guess what? We don't have a district, so thank you. Thank you for being here and bringing your children here, and more importantly, thank you, thank you for pouring your heart, su corazón, su amor, all your love to the district here in the city of Azusa. Congratulations again. Felicidades. And, and I would like to congratulate all the parents that received the 2023-24 uh, Parent of the Year Award. I'm so proud to see three daddies up there. Our fathers, I should say, right, right on. Great. And um, I want to thank you all for volunteering your time in your child's school sites and also join the committees because believe it or not, your input is very important to us when, on our decision making. And I'm so um, happy that you're always and from what I'm hearing in all the committees and the PTA and I know um, also um, Ms. Santos, she's not only in the school district, she's also like at the baseball field and Little League and you see her everywhere. Um, um, and I also, I want I want to uh, congratulate Ms. Santos. Well deserved. What I read about you and heard about you is very true. Very committed, passionate, great leader. And um, I appreciate you coming to our school sites. What more than anything, I, every time you see her, she has that same smile on her face all the time, no matter where she's at, because that shows you that she is happy doing what she does. Thank you.
I would like to um, I would like to thank the community for taking the time to come out and celebrating our amazing parent of the year. Congratulations to all the honorees. We are so thankful for all of you and for the students at your school sites. At this time, we will take a short recess to take a group photo to allow to allow those in attendance the opportunity to leave before we resume our board meeting. Can all the board members please join us in the center so we can take a group photo and the awardees.
We will now resume to our regular board meeting. We are now on item 7.1, public comment on agenda or non-agenda items. Lika, do we have any blue, uh, do we have anyone on Zoom? Or Hope, do we have any blue cards? Thank you. Lika, we do, do have one on Zoom? We do have one hand raised on Zoom, Ms. Tavia Lawson. Okay, um, she can start now. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Board President Rodriguez Pena, Board of Education, Cabinet, and attendees. I'm the chair of the East San Gabriel Valley Special Education Local Plan Area Community Advisory Committee. Myself, Marina Harper, and Leslie Castellanos are the parent representatives serving for Azusa Unified School District, and we have three updates. On Saturday, February 24th, the 16th Annual Transition Conference, Life After High School, which you will need to know, will take place at Coronado High School at 9 a.m. in the city of West Covina and is being hosted by our community agency partner, Parents Place. And then on Tuesday, March 12th, in person, at the East San Gabriel SELPA office in the city of Covina, the CAC will host its last training of the year on using task analysis and reinforcements to promote positive behaviors. This is in collaboration with Azusa CAC parents, the Azusa Unified School District Special Education Team, and the California Autism Professional Training and Information Network captain. The importance of task analysis um, will be talked about how it can be used at school, in the home, and in the community. This training is open to family, students, educators, and service providers. And then lastly, the fourth annual East San Gabriel Valley SELPA Community Advisory Committee Making a Difference nominations are currently open until Saturday, March 16th. Uh, please feel free to nominate classroom staff, other support staff, students, parents, guardians, and other volunteers who are making a difference in the lives of students with disabilities who are impacting a positive change in our instrumental in our community. Uh, you can learn more about our activities by visiting our social media pages and our emailing CACSELPA at gmail.com. That's C-A-C-S-E-L-P-A -S -S at gmail.com. And then I would just like to take out this time to thank all the parents uh, that were recognized this evening. You are truly making a difference in the lives of Azusa Unified School District as well as the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Larson. Uh, we are moving on now to item 8.1, comments and reports and requests by the Board of Education. Board Member Greer? I have no comments today. Board Member Bo? No comments this evening. Board Member Arianes. Good evening, everyone that's watching at home who and who are still here. I just want to wish everybody happy Valentine's Day. For those of us that celebrate, that don't celebrate, it's always a special day. So happy Valentine's to my colleagues and the cabinet and our student board member here, president, and our lovely secretary in the back, Miss Hope. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. So, okay, I'll take all of your times. So, um, I just want to announce Murray Elementary. This was a beautiful community garden cleanup, phase one. It was great to see parents, students, staff, and the Rotary Azusa High Interact students. Principal Acosta and retired teacher Alyssa Smith came out on a Saturday morning working together to clean the garden area so they can be planting vegetables. The garden will, will provide a place for students to be outside and be productive at the same time. 
The good news is that Murray Elementary has received a $500 grant from Kids Gardening to continue their project. I went to Azusa High School uh, with the San Gabriel Valley Consortium. We interviewed students in the data, excuse me, the, the digital media arts. We had mock trials with the students and preparing them for the internship, summer school internship. So many students are very well prepared and um, they're ready to go. Sierra High School, coffee with the principal. Ms. Peterson spoke about the new welding class offered at Pomona Fairflex. 17 students have registered so far from Sierra and Azusa High School. And I'm happy to say that they're mixed boys and girls. And I'm looking forward to, um, in the future, electrical. And I wanna thank um, Frank Chang, Director of College and Career Pathways, Richard Hernandez, from she's the Executive Director of San Gabriel ROP for making it possible. Glasgow Middle School, the annual faculty art showcase, it was fabulous. Now we know our students are great artists. Most of our students usually come in first or second place when they do the Grace Napoletano Award. Because our teachers, they, had a fab they did a fabulous job. They had ceramics, they had portraits that they did on their own and they showcased them. I went to Azusa High School Expo, full house, tables were full. It was great to see all the academics, clubs, sports, and organization offered at Azusa High School. I always enjoy hearing the students at their booth and when they're so um, proud to talk about what, what they're doing in their class time. And um, I did have a parent saying, wow, this is great, you know, that, you know, all these programs that are together. And that was the whole idea when we merged the high schools together to have more programs. And the kids were very excited. Um, the ad hoc committee that I belong to between the city of Azusa and Azusa Unified School District, our discussion this time was regarding our surplus properties, National Little League Field, Charter School, Sierra High School, SROs, and Rockvale signage. CSCA Area G Office Installation Brunch. Congratulations to CSCA President Patricia Sanchez and Diana Ochoa and Yvette Valdez. Thank you. Now we're moving on to item um, 9.1 comments and reports by student board member, superintendent, and cabinet. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Ortega, and Cabinet. As always, it's a pleasure to be here representing Sierra High School. I wanted to start by sharing how extremely proud I am that my mom, Marcia Santos, was chosen as Sierra and District Parent of the Year. I know how much you do for me, my siblings, and our family, but I know that you have also committed and contributed to being a part of positive change, not only for Sierra, but several other schools and the Azusa Unified School District as a whole. Thank you so much for all that you do, and I'm so happy and proud to see you be recognized and be able to be here with you tonight. Since the last meeting, we concluded our undefeated soccer season, and we also started our softball season with a great 16-5 win against San Antonio High School in Claremont. On January 31st, <clears throat> we had a great turnout for our Sierra FAFSA workshop in partnership with Citrus College. During this workshop, parents and students were given the opportunity to apply with direct instructions and support from our Citrus partners and our very own counselor and principal. Last week, on Tuesday, February 6th, Citrus College came out again during lunch to help our Sierra seniors apply the Citrus and the Promise Program. The Citrus Promise Program and Promise Grant allows students to receive up to two years for free tuition, vouchers for books, and re priority registration. For our recent Spirit Week, Spirit Day activities, we had Blackout Day where students came to school in all black, and this Friday we will have Dill Day where students will come dressed as their favorite iconic school, like Mickey and Minnie and SpongeBob and stuff. We also had our second Red Cross blood donation event last week. This event not only allowed Sierra students and staff to make a positive impact and potentially save lives, but it, it was also an opportunity for additional scholarship money for soon-to-be graduates just like you. As we quickly approach the end of the school year, we are kicking our focus on the future into high gear with scholarship season right ahead of us, more visitation, visits from post-secondary programs and field trips. I look forward to all that is to come here at Sierra. Thank you and go Spartans. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, the report from Azusa High School, Emery Hernandez. Good evening board members and attendees. 
First of all, Azusa High School would like to announce that they are proud of both boys and girls soccer teams, which because they have been successful in their first week of CIF competition. The boys varsity team defeated Oha Valley and Oakwood High School in the wild card round and defeated the Thatcher School 2-0 in round one action on February 9th. The girls varsity team defeated Cavalry Chapel and played against Artesia on Saturday night. Azusa High School is also proud of the student union who taught the LA County Museum of Natural History staff the community circle technique we implement in school and did a tour of the museum on February 9th, 2024. Azusa students will influence museum staff and the educational programs they offer students around the country. Azusa High School is proud of its students, Emmanuel Serrato, John Takuchi, Emily Ruiz, and Hector Hernandez, who participated in the four-way speech contest sponsored by Azusa Rotary on January 31st. The students gave impassioned speeches that challenged the audience to consider the good life. Way to go, Aztecs. Azusa High School would like to congratulate Alicia Alvaron for her nomination as Azusa High School's Parent of the Year. We are proud of her leadership and commitment and the parent community that she belongs to. Azusa High School is also hosting our second round of eighth grade tours on February 15th, and at the same time is hosting parents to tour the campus as well on February 15th and February 29th. Both eighth grade and AHS parents are welcome to join the tours starting at 8.30 on the East Campus. Azusa High School ASB is hosting the State East Dance to Infinity and Beyond on February 23rd at 7 p.m. Get ready Aztecs to get dancing. Also, Azusa High School ASB is hosting a blood drive on March 8th in the gym. Community members are welcome to donate blood and help Azusa High School students save lives. And lastly, AHS seniors and their families would like to do their, who would like to do their cap and gown order on the weekend can place an order beginning on February 17th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. by the main office on West Campus. Thank you. Superintendent Ortega. Thank you, <clears throat> Board President. Uh, first, I'd like to thank, thank Board President Rodriguez Pena for taking all of my comments for tonight. Um, congratulations to all the parents of the year uh, tonight. Uh, to echo the sentiment from the board, uh, we truly value uh, the voice of our parents. And what makes me extremely proud as a superintendent is that we don't only say that, but we can point to things, specific things that we can say because of a parent, this. And so that, um, that should make us all proud uh, that it's not just about hearing and listening, but doing. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Azusa Leaders for Learning Foundation. Uh, they recently approved a $3,000 donation to provide uh, 10 CTE students uh, with an internship uh, uh, stipend. And so that's going to that's gonna be very welcomed uh, by our students. Uh, and it's just a good way to uh, show a token of appreciation for the work that they're doing as interns. Um, I'd like to thank uh, CSEA and AEA uh, for their recent invitations. Uh, for CSEA, I was invited to attend the Area G Officer Installation event on Saturday, January 27th in uh, Whittier. And for AEA, I was invited to attend the CTA Service Center 1 Superintendent's Luncheon on Wednesday, February 7th. And so just want to thank uh, both labor partners uh, for their continued partnership. Uh, with the district. And then lastly, I just want to thank also the city for their partnership. Uh, we had our ad hoc meeting, as was stated by the board president on January 31st, and it was good to have a good, robust conversation uh, about the district and about the city. Thank you. I, too, would like to, again, congratulate all of our parents of the year um, and also highlight the Azusa High School Expo. Um, it's wonderful to see all of the options that are afforded to our students um, for them to seek and participate in all of the things that are of interest to them. I, too, would like to congratulate our Azusa High School Student Union. Um, they provided a training uh, to the staff at the Natural History Museum on community circles. 
Good evening all. I would like to start with congratulating all the parent of the years and for their hard work and their efforts and their continued dedication to our school district and to our families. Um, also share that we had an exciting weekend. Um, if you were at by our around the Valley Dale Elementary School, you saw the helicopter. We had our third helicopter dropped in our district, um, helicopter HVAC drop in our district. So I know our community were excited. Some of our students, we received pictures with everyone watching and everything. So that was nice. Um, also want to announce that we um, formally um, issued the RFP for our paramount modernization. What that means is that the DSA has finally approved our plans. And so now we have issued the RFP for contractors to submit their bids for the actual project. And then lastly, I just want to take a moment to apologize to all of our students and our staff on our thermostat um, installation. We did drop the ball. Um, and so we are trying to right our wrong. We, are, um, we have already issued a video, um, a how-to video to all of our staff. Um, we have our contractors out there working, um, but we went too fast. So we're going to slow down, make sure everyone's trained, and make sure we have the proper resources to make sure they're working. And I also want to follow in the chorus of congratulations to our parents who received an award and um, also to recognize that this uh, awards uh, ceremony is truly special. I really enjoy uh, being able to hear all the wonderful uh, reports that our parents, that our administrators gave about our parents. I also attended the CTA luncheon with our superintendent and cabinet. Um, it was nice to see our AEA president, Med Savella, uh, who also serves in a leadership capacity for CTA, uh, working that CTA luncheon and see her in action. So I want to thank Meg for her invitation. And then lastly, I also want to uh, wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. It's our people, um, like our students, um, our employees and families, um, that we have here in the Sousa Unified School District that makes us love what we do. So thank you all. Thank you. Now we're moving to item 10.1, approval of the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by Board of Education to be routine and will be enacted in one motion. There will be no discussion of these items unless requested by Board of Education member. If a Board of Education member Request this discussion. That item will be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Can I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 10.5, approval of the 2023 SARC. Um, motion by board member Bo. Do we have a second? Second. Second by board member Arianes. Student board preference? Yes. Okay, we will take a hand vote. Board member Bo? Yes. Board member Arianes? Yes. Board member Greer? Yes. And a yes for me, so 4-0. Now we, um, the item that was pulled, 11.1, we come to 11.1. And do we have a discussion, uh, board member Bo? Oh, I'd like to make a, may I make a motion to approve the item? Yes, you may. I'd like to make a motion to approve the item um, the 2023 SARC. Second the motion. Vote by board member Bo. Second by board member Arianes. Any discussion? Thank you. Um, Mr. Su Superintendent, uh, can you provide the board with a clarification around the um, approval of the annual SARC? 
Yes, I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Camacho to uh, explain that to us. The SARC uh, template and data that gets inputted into the SARC, the timing of that occurred um, on January 9th in that week um, and was delayed by the date of our next board meeting, which occurred on that same night. Um, so we had to bring it to this meeting. Just so that um, we're all on the same page, the, my understanding is the SARC is due annually on or before February 1st. So that means we have to, we should have board approval before the 1st? Correct. Okay. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure that as, as board members, we all were on the same page with compliance. I know that our uh, cabinet is doing everything possible to ensure compliance, but sometimes data is out of our control. So yeah. that, that's the only reason Thank I you for that, board member. We'll, we'll point that out. So we have a first and a second and a discussion. Can we place our vote on item 11.1? Motion passes 4-0. Now we're moving on to item, um, moving on to general functions, item 12.1. Approval of the agreement for phase two brokerage service with DCG strategies. Can I have a motion? Motion to approve 12.1. Motion by board member Arianis to have a second. Second. Second by board member Greer. Student board member vote. Motion. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question. It, is uh, CDG here tonight? Yes. Yes, yes they are here tonight. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. So, um, any more? Well, any discussion? For that? Any discussion? I would like to meet them if they're here tonight. Okay. They are actually uh, going to present uh, on twelve point two. Yes. They will. They will. Okay. So, so we have a first, a second. That was the discussion. Can we place our vote, please? So I don't like to wait to ask questions or, or while they're up here or just well, when they when they come up with their hands. Okay. Motion passes four zero. Now we're moving on to item 12.2, presentation of surplus property timeline. Mr. Ortega, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, board president. Um, tonight, um, we are uh, here to present a timeline uh, to the Board of Education uh, regarding our surplus property. If the board may recall, uh, when we began uh, the surplus phase three of school reorganization, uh, we were working with Sarah Polito, uh, but Sarah is at home, happy with the baby girl. And so she is on maternity leave right now. And so we have had the pleasure of working with Jessica Alrich and Sabrina Buendia, uh, who have been filling in uh, for Sarah uh, as she's on maternity leave. So tonight uh, we were going to be grace with Jessica Ehrlich and Sabrina Buendia, uh, but I uh, spoke to Jessica Ehrlich yesterday, um, and she has come down not only with COVID, but with pretty bad COVID. And so uh, Sabrina will be riding uh, solo uh, tonight, um, along with uh, our uh, DCG uh, partners. Uh, so Sabrina, I'll turn it over to you. I, I can put the timeline on the screen if... Uh, to make that easy for everyone. Oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much to the board and um, to Arturo and Latasha for having us here today. Um, like Arturo said, my name is Sabrina Buendia and I'm from Fagan Friedman and Holcross and we act as the district's legal counsel. Um, so today we wanted to present our surplus property timeline just to give the board and the district and everyone online 
an idea of what to expect going forward with the potential sale of these surplus properties. And so as you can see on the screen in front and the screen right here, um, the timeline is intended to be a resource and a cheat sheet for the district board, as well as Arturo and Latasha going forward. But we wanted to emphasize that um, this timeline is a working document and as specifics become, um, they will continue to be updated as specifics for each property um, progress going forward. So you'll notice that the timeline is actually broken up into two parts. The first part, and the reasoning behind that is that the district is required under the surplus property statutes to undergo various processes. So we thought it was important to have each process broken down um, along with the corresponding dates for each process. But when developing this timeline, um, we looked at each process through a lens of keeping our foot on the gas but also doing right by each particular process and the deadlines that the district is obligated to meet um, for each process. So as you'll see on page one and two, this will represent the by process breakdown of each property, um, or I'm sorry, by of each process, uh, but you will see that um, in the second part of the timeline, it is organized chronologically with the emphasis that multiple of these processes can occur simultaneously. So if we go back to the first portion of the timeline, this concerns the required notice period. So the statutes regarding the surplus property process requires the district to offer each property to specific entities and those entities will be described in statute. The district will provide notice um, and these entities will have about 60 days to respond to the district's notice. Um, and in addition, the district will publish these um, properties for sale in a local newspaper or publication. And so we understand that the district uses the Tribune. And so the district will publish um, that these properties are available for purchase uh, within the Tribune three successive weeks in a row. So. Um, as you can see, we have a proposed set of dates for the district to publish these properties in the Tribune. Um, and for those entities that are listed in the publication, the, those entities will have about 60 days from the last publication date. So the last um, date would be that March 6th date to make an offer on the property. Um, so that would be that May 5th date. That would be the last day that they can make an offer. Um, and if they do not make an offer, um, we will target the May 7th, 2024 board date to adopt a resolution of intent to sell the property. And so simultaneous to the notice period, oh, actually, I just wanted to note that the notices, um, we often find that these are courtesy. Um, so more often than not, those entities will not make an offer on the property. But um, in the event that they do, this is a working document. And of course, we will update for each specific property as the process progresses. So now going to the waiver process, um, simultaneous to the notice period, um, we understand that the district has opted to apply for a waiver with the State Board of Education, which is really great. It allows the district to have increased flexibility in the st statutory surplus property process. Um, and so in order for the district to apply for a waiver, um, um, we will have to do a few things. We'll have to do a public hearing as well as send notices to the 7-Eleven committee members that we had asked prior to uh, declare the properties of surplus, um, as well as the district's collective bargaining groups for input regarding submission of the waiver. And so all of these dates in developing the waiver process timeline, um, we're working backwards from the specific State Board of Education meeting that we've selected. And Excuse so, me, Sabrina. Oh, yes. Can my colleagues ask questions in between as they're speaking? Oh, Is that um, fine? I, okay, yes. Oh, okay, board member 
Bo. The other Sabrina. Sabrina uh -huh. Bo. Her name is Sabrina. <laughs> uh, Ms. Bunby, can you, this is a lot of information. Can you just clarify what the waiver allows us to do? Yes. So the waiver allows the district to um, forgo certain portions of the statutory surplus property process within the education code. Um, what the district will waive is dependent on what we decide to waive, but it is typically the waiver of the public auction process where typically the district will have to take the highest bidder. Um, all of the potential buyers of the properties will submit bids, um, and then those bids will be opened by the board, um, and the board will have to take the highest bidder. Um, but sometimes we apply for a waiver for the um, those particular provisions to be waived so that the district can um, engage instead in an RFP process, which is definitely something that um, DCG has assisted us heavily with um, in developing the dates for this timeline. But instead of being mandated to take the highest bidder, um, the district is instead able to consider a large variety of factors with um, one of them being purchase price, um, but it really allows for increased flexibility and it is very beneficial for the district to have a waiver. And as a follow-up question, are there other provisions that we would also waive in that waiver process? Yes, um, and we do have um, samples of those as well, if you would like to see um, those. But um, uh, I can definitely provide those to Arturo and Latasha for forwarding over. Um, it, it, it's um, an online process, and so each specific field will be entered in on the State Board of Education portal. Um, and then all the provisions to be waived will be bracketed out. So it's kind of helpful to see like which specific provisions will be crossed out. And so I can definitely provide what we typically put in those waiver applications to see which provisions are being waived. Thank you, that context would be helpful. I was gonna ask a question regarding the waiver also. So the waiver, what I'm reading here is um, two year period, but I believe the last meeting they discussed a uh, waiver if the property is not being sold for five years. Is oh, that different um, than, than what we're talking about here? Yes, that would be for unused site fees. Um, and so the for waiver. What? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It would be for unused site fees. Oh, on, oh. Yes. So two different processes. Yeah. The waiver will be for uh, granted for a period of two years um, following approval for the statutory surplus property process. Thank you. Any further questions? No comments? Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Continue. Yes. So working backwards from that July date, um, the SBE requires that the district submit the waiver, um, giving them approximately 10 to 12 weeks to review that application. And so working backwards from the July date, um, they will require that the waiver be submitted by April 9, 2024. And so prior to that, the district must hold a public hearing as well as adopt a resolution authorizing that the district approves of submitting the waiver for each property. And so prior to that March 12th date, the district will have to reach out to their 7-Eleven committee members as well as their collective bargaining groups um, as well as notice that public hearing um, for that March 12th board deadline. Okay, and so um, the waiver, we will pretty much know if the waiver is approved on that um, July 11th date. So the meeting is the July 10th through July 11th, and we'll pretty much know whether or not the waivers are approved on July 11th. Um, at which point the district will have waived certain provisions of the surplus property process for a period of two years. And so going towards the RFP process, um, this is running simultaneous to both the notice process as well as the waiver process. Um, the caveat is that the district cannot accept offers um, until the waiver is approved. But here, DCG has been very instrumental in providing us with the dates associated with the RFP process and with their expertise on how best to maximize the district's opportunities in this regard. So I would like to turn that over to Lauren to describe the DCG RFP process and um, take it from there. Hey, everyone. 
everyone. Always a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Lauren Jennings with DCG Strategies. I'm also joined in the back um, by Landis Graydon. Landis is our CEO and broker of record. Um, and so as we're transitioning into potentially brokerage services, um, you'll see his face back there more and more often um, as we um, get deeper into the process. So as you heard from Sabrina, um, the process is really broken down into three different buckets. You have the notice period, the waiver period, and then assuming your waiver is approved and assuming none of the public agencies that you're required to notify um, submit an intent to purchase the property, then you can then release the properties to the, what we call the general public for sale. Um, and so the first two brackets that Sabrina just went through were all dictated by educational code. So it's a lot of um, check marks that you have to go through, a lot of requirements, but again, that's all dictated by education code. And that was what you, Sabrina was mentioning in terms of we want to um, potentially, the State Board of Education will allow you to waive some of those requirements, which is really potentially to your benefit and just gives you that greater flexibility. So once again, assuming um, we submit the notices and you do not receive any responses to those notices, um, assuming you also do receive approval from the State Board of Education with that waiver, then like I said, the next step would be to release what's called the RFP, which stands for Request for Proposal. And that is essentially a document that our team would put together um, alongside legal counsel and staff. Um, with the property specific, um, we would include a deadline for when the district is requiring proposals to be received. And um, what we've done before in the past is that um, we can release the RFP prior to receiving State Board of Education approval. However, the caveat is, is that you need the State Board of Education approval in order to accept the RFP. So in our timeline, we typically will time it where uh, potentially the RFP, excuse me, the proposal responses are due the week after the assumed State Board of Education approval. Um, I've been doing this for many, many years, and um, the trend in most recent years, um, I would say over the past five to 10 years, is that and we've never had a, a, a district be denied a waiver from the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education has been trending where they're approving um, the waivers. However, there's always certain caveats, and so they'll say approved with these conditions. Um, and likely the conditions are, you know, not anything major, but just certain steps, again, that the district has to take to make sure that you abide by those waiver provisions. And so um, when we release the RFP, we will receive proposals. Um, typically the proposals will come to our team as your broker or representative. We will receive and review each of those proposals. And a part of our job is not only to um, receive them, but also to make sure that we're reviewing them and providing you as the board and potentially if you were to establish a committee who could review those, um, provide, provide them with data so that you can compare the proposals to each other. Um, we also typically recommend, again, assuming a waiver process is um, prior to determining which proposal you're going to receive or accept, um, holding an interview process. Um, we have found many, many times with working with school districts and um, you know, selling surplus property that a lot of times, I mean, everybody knows, a lot of times you can write certain things in your proposal, but then it's always good just to interview, just to make sure that the values and the, um, the values of your proposal, proposer or potential buyer align with the district values. Um, so that's something that we have built into, into the process as well. And so everything throughout this um, timeline in terms of the RFP process would be run by our team, the brokerage team. Uh, we will, of course, work hand in hand with legal counsel, but this is re really where we get into the real estate piece of it. Um, and so this timeline, again, really runs through accepting proposals, going through the interviews, making, um, bringing potentially the proposals back to the board for board consideration, um, and then the board, um, if you so choose, selecting a proposer and a proposal to accept and enter into negotiations with. And so as we move further down this process, um, further down the timeline, excuse me, this is sort of the next step. Um, all of these, and I have to say this, all of these dates are 
hypothetical. We did our best based off of past experience to put a timeline together. However, this will vary as we get deeper into the process. And so the next few steps um, really um, go through what happens after you accept the proposal, should you accept the proposal, because it's still up to you as a board whether you want to accept and enter into negotiations. Um, so the next step would be, you know, once you select a, a buyer, then you would negotiate a purchase and sale agreement. And when I say you, um, our team, should you, um, should you go to that step, we would negotiate on your behalf, obviously um, in conjunction with staff. Um, and we would prepare a purchase and sale agreement that would be brought to the board for review and final approval. And then um, once you have a mutually executed purchase and sale agreement, that's the time where you would officially agree to terms, you would officially agree to timeline, you would officially agree to all those, all those um, specific details that are really important. So we would negotiate that on behalf, or excuse me, in conjunction with legal counsel. Um, and then, then, then we would officially open escrow. And so escrow would be the time where the buyer would complete all the due diligence, um, and then the end goal would be close of escrow, which is when the sale is completed, um, the title officially transfers from the district to the new buyer, and the district receives the deposit of funds. Um, so that is a high level overview of that process. Um, depending on the proposals and depending on the buyer, um, that brokerage period could take anywhere from I mean, if we're lucky, 18 months. <laughs> um, and a normal timeline would be closer to 24 to 36 months. Um, the reason being, um, and this is subject fully to negotiation, but typically, um, you know, if you have a developer, so to speak, who is looking to purchase property, um, a lot of times they need time to go through the due diligence process with whatever the governing jurisdiction is and to receive what's called entitlements. Entitlements are basically permits and allowances from the jurisdiction for them to build what they are intending to build. So that process ranges, um, depending on the jurisdiction and depending on their timeline, it ranges from uh, roughly 18 months to 36 months. And so um, this again is just very high level. Any questions about that brokerage RFP process? Like member Beer? Well, I, I have a handful of questions, but I'll, but I'll wait till so I'll wait till the end. So, uh, board, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Sabrina Bondia and Lauren Jennings for being here tonight. Um, as Sabrina said, um, we wanted to give you two views of this. Uh, view number one was by um, by process, and then view number two, as you can see, was by um, chronological order. Um, but they're open to two questions. Yes, board member Beer. Okay. So I'll try to ask these questions quickly and please feel, feel free to just, it, these, some of these are clarifying questions. Um, so a answer them as quickly as I, as I even asked. Um, so for example, uh, Lauren, you'd already shared that these, these dates here are tentative and, and, and projected. Does that mean that, that these dates could also be expedited or are you giving that caution as to communicate that this is best case scenario? I think that this would be best case scenario. I think the dates that run simultaneously would be the notice period, the waiver process, and the RFP process, all of which we've expedited as much as we think we can at this point. But um, the dates that are tentative would follow once um, we reached that RFP process, once we've received um, the RFPs, evaluated them, and then um, have selected a buyer. Okay, another question we talked about needing to make the, the properties available to certain entities first. And then I believe one of you said that it's possible that we may, that, that there may not be any offers. Does that mean that, that some of the, the local entities would, would communicate a no early so we would not have to wait for that period to end or would we still need to wait the, what is it, the 60 days, uh, or 90 days that's listed on here, 60 days? Yeah, that is actually a very great question. Sometimes they do communicate early and rather than um, going through the three publications, sometimes they will communicate to us within the first publication that they no longer would like to, or they would not be interested in the properties, at which point um, potentially we could 
expedite that process, but we still think that targeting the May 7th board meeting would be um, conservative running alongside the later part. Okay, and then another question that we had the last time we were discussing this was feedback regarding the, the capacity of DCG and, 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 and F3 for us to be able to move forward with all properties at, at one time. Um, and so based off of what's being presented, my assumption is that the thinking is that it, that, 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 that would be an okay thing and wise thing for us to do. Um, I think, Lauren, did you want to comment on the rollout of each property? So uh, we, that was a question that was received at the last board meeting that I was to at least. And yes, our recommendation is that the market can handle um, potentially however, four, three, however many properties the board decides um, to release to the market just due to the varying jurisdictions. Okay, and, and I, think, I think this is my last question. So we're saying 24 to 36 months before escrow escrow closes and so so to be clear that means that would mean 24 to 36 months for the for the properties to still sit vacant during that that time and 24 to 36 months i guess 18 to 36 months before the district receives funds and and is able to use leverage those funds for capital projects or whatnot within the district so yes and no um, so yes to the properties would sit vacant because during the entitlement process, um, the district still owns the property. However, the buyer is going through the process of getting applications. And so typically you wouldn't allow them to do anything on your site until they officially own it. Uh, regarding the money uh, question, um, I said yes and no, because um, yes, you will not receive the full amount of funds until the end. However, um, the how much funds you receive throughout the process is subject to negotiation. So, for example, what we typically recommend during the negotiation process, and we can, um, you know, we can negotiate with the district or with the potential buyer on it, is having certain milestones where certain milestones are met by the buyer, then they can potentially release non-refundable funds that are released to the district immediately. So, for example, it could be, you know, an amount, maybe it's $500,000, that once they hit this threshold, this is released to the district immediately, it's non-refundable, it's applicable to the purchase price, but that would be cash in hand. Um, that's not all of the money though, but um, so that's potentially how we can structure it. Okay, because then I'll just comment, that was probably the the most surprising thing that I, that I read on the report. Um, I don't think that I expected that the process is what the process is, but I don't think I anticipated that. I know that as we've had a number of properties already that have been sitting vacant and, and we've been having conversations about waivers and, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, let's get these waivers in place, but we're going to, if we sell the properties anyway, then, then we'll, we'll, it'll, it'll be moot, but it, but it appears that, that we're still looking at the best case scenario that this property's still sitting mm -hmm. vacant for years to come and all of the inherent challenges that, that come with that. Uh, my my hope, my request, my is that we would be able to get ahead of this and communicate to our community that this is a a, a hurry up and wait type of situation, um, so so that we're 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 not seeming to let, let's just get ahead of, of of expectations where there's just wonderings and questionings around what where and why are the why are the properties still still sitting there when in truth we're actively working towards doing something with the properties but there's an inherent part of the process where, where, where we just have to wait. Um, can I just add one more thing? Sure. So I want to give the caveat, however, that um, the 24 to 36 months assumes a few things, right? That assumes that it's potentially a residential buyer. It could not be a, a residential developer. It could be sold as is. Um, also, too, um, so as is, um, if you remember when we did, when I gave that high-level timeline, it's a lot shorter um, because you the buyer potentially would be using the buildings as is, and so therefore they don't need to go through that entitlement process, which is longer. Also, too, the district does have the option to not sell the property subject to entitlement. You can sell the property even if it is to a developer as is. However, the caveat there is, is that if you want it to maximize value, then it would be in your best interest to allow the buyer 
time to go through that planning process. Because it's essentially rent. You're essentially saying, um, you know, I'm taking, if you give them the time period, if you're saying, I'm taking away your rent, so therefore, go through the planning process and then pay me the maximum value of the property. Um, the, the other option would be to say, you take all the risk as the buyer. I'm not giving you time to go through the entitlement process. So then that would likely lead to a lower value. So the timeline comes with caveats. You have options to decide if you want to allow that long process. And, and, that, and that makes sense. And so to be clear, we would we would potentially be at a, at a part in the process where we have received a proposal, we've accepted a proposal, we've identified a buyer, we've negotiated, everybody's in agreement. And now in order to maximize, we are now waiting the the, the, the entitlement process, which could be up, upwards of, of 30, 36 months. Correct, yes. Okay. Any further questions? I, well, I, I have a question. I have a question. Um, as board member Greer mentioned, community. So, um, talking to the cabinet and the superintendent, is it possible that we can put out a um, newsletter to the community on, you know, what the process is or how long it's gonna take, just like we did the, the school bond process, you know, what do we do, you know, where are we at? And I think it should go to the whole community so they know. Um, and, and I think it's really important that we do, because it's true, they do wanna know why they're still there. And it's, you know, you guys are not doing anything, which we are, but it takes time but I, I really think it's really important that the community knows in a newsletter and um, knows the process and that we are working on it. That is my recommendation. I second that recommendation. Thank you. Board President, I, I wanted to ask uh, Lauren um, just to keep the story going uh, that board member Greer has opened up. So let's let's call it all the negotiations and then the 36 starts right and so let's say in 36 months it's it's done congratulations we're closed but that doesn't mean that on day on month 37 day one the school is demolished and then construction happens what what is typically do you see once it's in the developer's hand how long is it still going to sit there empty before they do something, do you, you think that is that a quick process, or what 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 have you seen in terms of that? Yeah, another great question. So, after title officially transfers away from the district, I, this is assuming it's a residential development or developer. Um, then, typically, um, they have it could be six months to another year before they can actually start construction and go through demolition. Um, again, this is all based off of the negotiation, but typically what we recommend um, is for a district to close escrow upon receipt of what's called a tentative map. Um, that's essentially the point where going through the process with city council, they receive planning commission approval, they receive city council approval for the development, and then they um, bypass, or not bypass, the appeal period expires, and so they've basically gone through all the administrative work that needs to happen. Um, there is a such thing called a final map, which has um, is make could be six to twelve months after. Typically, developers prefer to close that final map <laughs> because they basically don't want the holding costs associated. But every the risk is gone once they receive final map. So that's typically our recommendation, um, and typically that's happened. Um, and so. That gap period could be another six to 12 months where nothing's happening at the property. Well, they could be doing underground work, but um, to the naked eye, nothing's happening. So, so I just wanted to add one thing regarding the proposal um, between all this transfers and all this stuff going on. You know, I like to like who is responsible at the time to, you know, gate it up or, you know, um, Word windows or what ha whatever happens, you know, who, who is responsible at what time? Great question. So the district is responsible for the property until close of escrow and until title transfers. So during the RFP and the brokerage and the escrow period, you still own the property. 
you still are the official title owner, and so therefore you would still be responsible for the property. Thank you. So, what member group? So then just adding another layer to the communication is, it, I, I see it as tremendously valuable to let's let's celebrate when the when the, when escrow closed, find a way to communicate the properties have been sold um, so as to make it clear yeah. that from this moment forward, we're done and, and we're moving on to capital projects and whatnot and, and whatever happens next is on is on a developer. Well, the community needs to know the good, bad and the ugly in right. the final, right? Right. I, I think it's very important. Any further question? Adrian, thank you for hitting it out of the ballpark here. I think that it was all in our minds. You know, what's going to happen with these properties is one of the things that, things that we as a board had uh, had asked was that the properties, you know, uh, not be abandoned um, for a long time. And so with the communication and, um, you know, uh, knowing the timeline um, in, the, in the community, knowing and understanding this, I am just... Um, suggesting and making sure that we upkeep those properties um, until it's time to let them go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great timeline. Great job. Thank you, board members. And I just really wanted to emphasize how great everyone has been throughout this process as thought partners. Um, and we really appreciate Arturo and Latasha's guidance throughout this process. And we just acknowledge that this is a very exciting time for the district and we're so happy to help, um, and we're very excited for the future. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so now we're moving on to item 12.3, resolution number 23-24-17, approval recommendations for surplus property and authorization district staff to proceed with all the necessary process. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Motion by Board Member Guerra. Do we have a second? Second by Board Member Arianes. Any discussion? Student preferential vote? Yes. Thank you. Colleagues, Thank you. please place your vote. Motion. Motion passes for zero. Now we're moving on to item 12.4, approval and update of the Zuzu Unified School District Board of Education Handbook. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Motion by Board Member Greer. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Board Member Arianes. Any discussion? Yes, I have just one request. Uh, quick, quickly, if you look at what is this, page seven, item number 10, I know we talked about this during our governance, um, the, the, the question around the, the order and the timing around motions and seconds. My, my request is that we add, similar to what we have in number nine, add a clause that says um, at, the, at the board president's discretion, um, so as to allow for um, a, a scenario where a sitting board president would prefer that, that it move uh, quicker, but but also allow for discretion where a board president would prefer that it, that it that it be slowed down. Any further discussion? I I, I agree with board member Greer. I believe it depends on each each board president. Um, usually runs our meeting different, right? And I uh, I don't want to just put it in, um, in stone that you have to do this and you have to do that. It's really up to the board president when they're sitting here what their um what they prefer. So will we, um, do you agree, uh, colleagues, to have that changed? Yes. Yes. The majority states. <laughs> what remember, you have a question? Oh, no, I was agreeing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just for clarification. Yes, sir. It would be super simple at the board president's discretion, comma, and then the rest of that sentence for number 10. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, place your vote, please. Motion passes for zero. And now we're moving on to item 13.1, except uh, acceptance of 2022-23 district audit report. 
Mr. Mao, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Board President. Ms. Yolanda Rodriguez Pena, we have our auditors tonight. I'm moving online, Ms. Guillermo, um, who will be presenting the district's audit report for the 22 23 fiscal school year. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hi, good evening to everyone. I am Garima from Harshwal and Company. And with me, I have my managing partner, Sanwar Harshwal. And we are here to present the audit report. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank Latasha because she made all the effort to finish the audit on time. Mm -hmm. She was available on the call, on the emails, after office hours. So, I mean, uh, she was she was really helpful to get all the documents on time. And that's the reason we were able to submit the audit. We were able to finish the uh, submission to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse on time. Thank you very much. We're also very happy to have her. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. She was my savior. Anytime I had an issue, I just used to call her, text her. And she was like, you know, super kind to receive my call, uh, calls. And most of the time she was also busy in the, you know, meetings, and but she used to call me back. So I really, I really appreciate the time she gave me and uh, we were able to finish this. So I'll start with my presentation. Audit framework uh, consists of planning, risk assessment, field work, review and reporting. This time we were on site thrice. Uh, we were around March to finish the state compliance. Then we, we came around October and then November. Auditor's responsibility is to form and express an opinion on the financial statement, major federal award program compliance, state program compliance. We have to exercise professional judgment and maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit. Uh, to identify and assess the risk of material misstatement on the financial statement, whether due to fraud, 